In this video, we'll be reviewing various strategies that you can use to increase questioning in your classroom, both in frequency and in quality of questioning. Even though this is not a particular dimension listed on your rubric, questioning shows up in various parts of the whole t-test rubric overall. And by having this higher order questioning, it really benefits you in various areas, either using an observation or just in your everyday class. So what does the rubric say about questioning? So these are areas, these were characteristics brought from many dimensions. We have questions that encourage all students to engage in complex higher order thinking. Uh, the teacher uses probing questions to clarify and elaborate learning. And then they ask, remember, understand, and apply level questions that focus on the objective of the lesson and provoke discussion. Where to start with your questioning? Well, it all starts with your lesson plan. Whenever you're doing your lesson plan, it's best to pre-plan questions that you want to ask and when to ask them during the lesson. The benefit of doing this is you can think through asking what questions you're going to ask that have to do with higher level thinking. A lot of times when we ask questions on the fly, they're going to be ones that are uh, at the remember level or who, what, when, where type questions. We want to ask more of the analysis and th synthesis and evaluation questions. And if we have a chance to really think it through in our lesson plan, we have a better chance of it happening during the lesson. So things to think about whenever you're pre-planning your questions. When students enter the, my classroom, they will know. So what is their background knowledge before starting the lesson that you're planning? Next thing you want to ask yourself, in order to lead them to master the objective, I will ask them. So these are going to be purposeful questions that go towards measuring the objective. So these could be checkpoint questions during the lesson. This also forces you to break down your objective and to see maybe after 15 minutes of a lesson, how where are they in towards mastering that objective and what questions can I ask. And then the next question to think about in your lesson plan is in order to lead them to master the objective, I will ask them. This could also come into play whenever you're doing your check for mastery at the end of class. So these are all different things to think about as you're making your lesson plan. One other tip that I have that I that really helped me is whatever visual I use to structure my lesson. Sometimes I use PowerPoints to guide my instructions or use a Prezi. I would also put maybe in the corner of one of the slides the questions I wanted to ask when I got to that part of the lesson. The reason why I did that is because sometimes I would get going with the lesson and I would completely forget the questions that I had already pre-planned. So that was something I did to give me a visual reminder of when I needed to ask those questions. Not only do you think it, need to think about the asking questions, but also think about the quality and the variety of thinking that you're provoking by asking these questions. So you still need to ask some of those knowledge and comprehension. That's kind of your recall of your facts. You still need to know that they understand what you're teaching them, but then you need to take it a step further. So after I've taught them a skill, how are they going to apply that skill into a real world situation? How are they going to pick apart the pieces and analyze it? How are they going to put those pieces back together maybe in a new situation and synthesize it? I often found evaluation to be one of the easiest, even though it's one of the highest level, one of the easiest levels of thinking to come up with on the fly, because this is whenever you come up with your ranking. This is whenever you uh, have to talk about maybe, look, you know, what if you're talking about the American Revolution? Which cause was the top cause of the American Revolution? Uh, you, whenever you're looking at your, um, if you're looking at a piece of theater and stage movement, what type of movement is the most important in invoking emotions during a play? This is where you can really get them to think of what's the best or what's the worst or using some type of spectrum. So it really is easy to get that evaluation in there. And the other thing to think of, and this could be during your lesson plan to consider during your actual lesson, is what would be your ideal student response to the questions that you ask? A lot of people don't get to this part. They don't think of, how would I want my students to answer this question? So that's something else you should keep in mind when you're pre-planning those lesson, those questions in your lesson plan. Something that would be a resource for you is the depth of knowledge chart. This is something that's been passed around through our school district and all over the state and the country. This gives you a way to differentiate the levels of thinking and it also gives you some question stems. Uh, the handout for this is in the T-Test Tips folder and the link for that is in the comment section of the video. So you're getting to your questions during the lesson. So now we're getting to some logistics. When should you ask these questions? And more importantly, after you ask them, what if they can't answer the question? So these are things you need to think about. When to ask, 
This could be checkpoints. This could be making sure that they understand the directions. It could be um, having them talk to each other. So there's lots of times there's really no right or wrong answer to when to ask the questions. You just want to make sure you don't try to ask so many of them because you're trying to um, really emphasize questioning. You don't want it to be at a time that doesn't seem like it really makes sense. When you ask your questions, you really want to give three to five seconds of wait time. Some of us really feel like we have to just fill the air and just keep on talking. And it, sometimes kids just need that time to process. So try to give your kids three to five seconds to think about the question and to try to answer it before you um, either go to scaffolding the question or phone a friend or things like that. What if they can't answer the question? This is when your teaching skills with scaffolding come in. You might have to go back in your question down to a lower level. Let's say you're asking an evaluation question and they have no clue. You may have to go back down to a recall lower level, make sure they understand some of the terms or vocabulary in your question, and then build back up to that higher level question. There's nothing wrong in doing that if the kid can get it. Really try to avoid letting a kid get away with saying, I don't know, or I can't answer that. Try to build them up and keep probing them with more clarifying questions to build back up to that higher level question. Whenever you just pass along to another student or say they can phone a friend, then you're just showing that they can get away with not answering a question. So you really don't want to give up on them. And that actually hits another dimension in T-test with achieving expectations. It shows that you have those high expectations for your kids. Since T-test is a very student-centered rubric, really great way to get this in with questioning is to have the kids write the questions and ask each other the questions. One of the things I did when I was teaching is I actually did a little mini lesson teaching the kids different levels of questioning and the one I liked the best was using Costas level of questioning and it was three levels and this is an avid strategy that really uh, my kids in middle school they really understood. There's three levels of questions and so you're, whenever you're teaching this to the kids, they only have three to remember, whereas Blooms, you have six to remember. Or, you know, there's different levels, and it may not be able to remember as much. So I would teach my kids how to create various levels of questions. And then during the year, I might say with their notes or with something else, write a level two question or write a level three question. Now go and pair up with somebody and ask that question. So one thing you may have to do whenever you're teaching your kids how to write questions and you may have to give them question stems to start their question. Also if you're having kids maybe in a discussion or it paired up in some paired sharing you may have to give them response stems and that's okay that's helping them to think and complete sentences. So the handout that I would often give my kids I had two handouts the other one is in the in the t-test tips folder and this would give them the verbs that they would be using for those three levels of questioning from these AVID strategies. So my students would often get this handout and then they'd also get the other handout I created for them that had some different example questions and question stems that would help them to write their own questions. So just wanted to show this visual of your level one, which is your foundation. And then you're going to build upon it with your second level. And then you put the top, you put the roof on. And it's kind of the icing on the cake where you really elaborate. So some different strategies that are very specific to questioning. These could also hit your student-centered learning, grouping, uh, student discussions. They t all this stuff tends to overlap, but this is another way to get in some questioning. Think, pair, share is one. Let's say you're doing a whole class lesson. It's the beginning of a unit. you got to kind of give the kids some foundation before you get into the higher level thinking. Uh, give them an opportunity to think, pair, share. So what I would do is I would pose the question. And then I would have them think and do a written response for maybe a minute. After that, I'd have them pair up with their elbow partner, somebody that was sitting right next to them, and share their responses for maybe two minutes with each other. And this might be another spot where I give them some response stems. And then we may spend maybe two to three minutes as a class sharing out our responses. So this gives the kids a chance to think about it individually, then talk about it again with somebody, with a partner and maybe refine their answer before it's shared with the class. And another little thing I might add in there is I might tell the pairs that when I'd ask for their response, I want to know what their partner said. And that also helps me to see if they were really listening. Socratic seminars, these are very higher level. 
I could see this really working well in high school classes. Now it could work in middle school classes as well. You just may have to adapt it a little bit or you may need to give a lot of uh, structure and setup before you have this seminar. Usually with Socratic seminar, you start with some type of reading or an article, try to find something that's really relevant to the kids and really meaningful. And you, all, and you start with the first question. It could be the teacher or student starts with a question. And then that continues the discussion. And then this is something where they discuss in their seminar, maybe in a big circle, something like that. It's more open-ended than, say, inner outer circle, which is what I used more with my middle school kids. But um, it is something that is very high level and a structured way to do uh, a structured way to do discussions. Another real simple one is uh, called spin a question, and this link you can find a um, a template for this online. So you start with making them a little spinner, and it just has it it just has your different starters: who, what, when, where, why, maybe how. And this is all on a spinner, and then you spin it around, and whenever it, and it starts, when it gets to that starter, the kids will come up with the question, and, but it has to start with that word. Why, what, how do you, what do you think, things like that. So it kind of makes, it randomizes the questioning when you're having them debrief something. Inner outer circle, like I said, I use this a lot with my middle schoolers. So again, you have an article, just like you do with Socratic Seminar. And this one, I would have the kids, they would have to write maybe... Um, four to five questions about the article and this was usually their homework before coming in for that discussion sometimes you got the questions from the kids and sometimes you didn't uh, for my kids if they didn't have the questions ready the day we did our discussion then they had to sit on the outside of the circle and they got a reduced grade because they didn't have their preparation so you would have a group of kids on the inside and then they have a partner that's outside of them this partner also met they also write down comments, critiques, uh, further questions that they might have. They also mark how many times their partner responded to a question or how many times they asked a question, how many times they maybe provided evidence from their reading. They kind of analyze how, the spe how their partner is speaking with the group. After maybe, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes of that inner circle discussing, then your outer circle and your inner circle switch. And then the same thing happens where the now the outer circle is the inner circle, and the inner circle is the one analyzing their partner. Uh, I did this with my middle school on-level pre-AP, my um, stacked classes with uh, my inclusion, and it was something that was structured enough that everybody could participate in it, and the levels could be different, and they really enjoyed it. Another strategy is called the hot seat. The hot seat is an activity where the kids are formulating questions and so they have they have to know the difference between those obvious on the surface answers and they have to know what the under the surface answers might have to be where maybe you have to make an inference. So this is a really good strategy to use when you're wanting them to make inferences. So what you do to play the hot seat, one student selected to play the role of the main character, maybe in a text or main character in a story or the main scientist that conducted the experiment for the topic you're uh, discussing in science. Uh, so they're sent out of the room and the rest of the class generates their list of questions they're going to ask the character. So that character comes back in the room and they sit in the hot seat. And the students take turns asking that character questions. And so the student in the hot seat has to attempt to answer the questions from that character's point of view. So if they're Andrew Jackson in the hot seat, they have to answer the questions from Andrew Jackson's point of view. This can, And then you do this for maybe a few minutes that they are in the hot seat, and then you switch roles and have another student in the hot seat. And then maybe after that they can compare and contrast their different characters' answers. So this is another one where some differentiation can come into play, where you may have some kids that would prefer to just ask the questions, and may not feel as comfortable being on the hot seat where you may have those kids that they want to answer all the questions and this gives them that five minutes to really shine and be the center of attention where they can ask those they can answer those questions. So some final thoughts with questioning. Make sure you pre-plan your questions in your lesson plans. And most importantly, this has been in my other video that's about the lesson objective. Everything has to tie back to the objective. So make sure your questions are aligned to your objective, also to your TEKS. You want to have them be purposeful. 
even if it's asking questions about a certain directions or activity, as long as it's leading to a line to mastering the objective, then it's purposeful. The other thing that not a lot of people think about is what is your ideal student response? How do you want them to answer this question? And then think about what do I do if they can't answer it? How do I scaffold and go back maybe in levels of thinking and then build the kid back up to that higher level? And then the biggest thing, involve your students. Have them write questions. Have them answer the questions that they themselves wrote. Have them do student discussions. The more the kids are involved, the more student-centered the lesson is, the better it is for the kids. I hope this gave you some ideas for using questioning in class, not just ways to ask questions or different activities, but also the logistics of preparing before the lesson and how to keep those questions aligned to your objective.